everyone, welcome to today's edition of One Single Story. It's October the 18th, and today we're in John chapter 6, which is a long chapter. It's, I don't know, 71 verses yep. maybe. And we're going to look at the last 11 or so verses. It says, many of his disciples, so speaking of Jesus, said, this is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? Jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining, so he said to them, Does this offend you? Then what will you think if you see the Son of Man ascend to heaven again? The Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but some of you do not believe me. For Jesus knew from the beginning which ones didn't believe, and he knew who would betray him. Then he said, that is why I said that people can't come to me unless the Father gives them to me. Um, so just a little background about what's going on here. Jesus has just finished talking about being the bread of life, which we're actually preaching on on the Sunday that this would give us the opportunity. And he talks about them eating his flesh and drinking his blood, which is weird. Let's mm-hmm. just be honest. Like yeah. this, we we take communion like it ain't nothing. Yeah. But if if you're, this is, it, a new yeah, this is a whole new concept. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's kind of the backdrop to this passage where they say they're complaining. This is very hard to understand. Um, how can anyone accept it? And the interesting thing is so. Um, before I ask the question that is on the paper, I want to ask this question. Um, they are clearly not complaining to him because he knows what they're saying. Now, whether he's reading their mind, reading their lips, Overhearing. using his <clears throat> divine ears to hear what they're saying, they're clearly not complaining to him. Why is it that typically people will not go to the source and want to go somewhere else because he's the only one can answer the question. I mean, right? Like nobody else is. Mm-hmm. Why, why do why do we do that? I think there's multiple reasons. People don't want to feel ridiculous for asking questions that apparently the speaker thought they should already understand. So there's probably some embarrassment there. Um, <laughs> honestly, a lot of times I think it's because people just want to discuss it with somebody else and. They may not necessarily want the actual answer. They just want to talk about it mm-hmm. with somebody. They're not as concerned as as concerned with the answers as they are with other people's opinions about what has been said. Yeah, I think often I'm gonna say we because it's easy to get caught up in that just talking about things rather than going directly mm-hmm. to a source. Is I think human nature is you want somebody on your side. You want somebody to understand you. Um, even if you're confused, you want people to be confused. Yeah, you want you're looking for the confused people. <laughs> That's to talk right. To. Yeah, because yeah. they tend to attract each other. Yeah, I, I've heard it said multiple ways. You know, I think Dave Ramsey says if you're talking, if you're complaining laterally or down, you're gossiping. Yeah, the only way you can complain is up. And I heard somebody simplify that this week. They said complain up. If you talk laterally, you're gossiping, which I found to be, you should only talk to somebody who can do something Mm -hmm. about it. And in this case, they can't do anything about it. Only Jesus can, you know. And it says that it was very hard to understand how can anyone accept it. Um, Why do you think people turn away from Christ when it gets hard and difficult to understand? And... Well, let's just start there. Why? Why do you think we, Pete? Not well. I can say we, but I know people in our shoes that when things get tough, they're gonna bail. You know, um, why? When we can't explain things, do we just throw up our hands and quit? There's a multitude of reasons. Um, I feel like one of the big reasons is. It seems that we have conveyed, and when I say we, I'm talking about our society, the the modern church in general, that we have conveyed a message of convenience. We've conveyed a message of um, life is 
will be good. It will be better. It will be easy. And by the way, if, if, if you have a crisis, we can pray and then we get relief. And um, rather than teaching, as Jesus often did, that in this life you're going to struggle, you're going to suffer, but you've got hope because you have me. Um, I think our concept, and even the world we live in, of instant gratification, uh, you know, we complain if we go through the drive through which we don't even have to get out of our air-conditioned cars, but if, if it's backed up 30 seconds, you know, we complain about that. And I, th- I think we even take this concept of the gospel that it's convenience, it is quick, it is easy, it's about me rather than it's about him. Uh, and that often looks entirely different than what we think it's going to look like. I agree because Jesus was very clear about the fact that being a follower of his was going to take a lot of sacrifice and it wasn't going to be comfortable or easy. He never promises that. But I think that it is true that um, we kind of cheapen the gospel in a lot of ways because we have put it in a much prettier package than it actually belongs in. And then when the doubt... And the hard times do come. I think the way that Jesus preached those things you should expect, and that is part of our life. But I feel that now we can't even help people understand it or explain it in a way in a way that makes sense with the gospel that they have been hearing mm-hmm. from us, because it has been in such a nice little package that that you know the hardships in life haven't necessarily been taken into account. We haven't. We don't prepare people well for that. Haven't counted the cost. You know, um, that's a passage of scripture where he, he said, in essence, unless you're prepared uh, to die to yourself, take up your cross and follow me, you can't be a disciple. Um, mm-hmm. and, and literally what he was saying was that there, it's going to take some effort. It's going to be difficult at times. There will be seasons you don't understand that you don't like. Um, if you're going to follow me rather than this concept, you use the term uh, a nice neat package where where we put it together and and the concept is oh it's it's easy it's quick uh it's about me well isn't the word of god or at least part of the purpose of the word of god intended to sift our hearts and determine where we stand Mm -hmm. i mean like it's it's to shake loose the things that aren't Absolutely. Yeah. Part of its design is is for correction and rebuke. You know, it is it is designed so that when my thought process is not right, my behavior is not right, uh, that I can I can get in the word and all of a sudden like, oh, man, I really messed that up. I miss that completely. And the Holy Spirit can convict me and then draw me back to him. It, yeah, it's it's not just there uh, so that we can feel good and, and everything's lovely and um, no heartache, no struggle. Yeah, well, as we were recording this, we just finished up what was about a four or five week stretch of painful sermons mm-hmm. from my perspective. Just like, oh my, I might as, might as well take a gun in and start shooting people. That's kind of how it feels. But I said a couple of times during that period if you walk out of here every Sunday happy about what I've said, haven't always. I haven't done always my job. done what you're That's supposed right. to do. That's yeah. right. Um, that doesn't mean everybody feels that way. But if the word of God is being <laughs> preached, sometimes it is going to shake us mm-hmm. and sift us. Sometimes we should go, man. This is diff- I don't understand it. Yeah. I don't know what it is God wants. Why is this so difficult? You know, we should have those moments. The question is what we're going to do about it. And we're going to talk about that in just a little while. Um, but. Um, 62 through 64, he's saying, he's talking about eternal life. What was their hang up about eternal life? Why was this the struggle? It seems to, that seems to be, at least that's what he's addressing, mm-hmm. you know, is eternal life. Why, why is that their hang up? I think same reason it's our hang up oftentimes, you know, we have a concept of, quote, heaven uh, to some degree and eternal life, but yet we live in the here and now. And it's so easy for everything to be fixated on this life because this is where we are. This is the moment we're in. This is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm struggling with. This is what I'm going through. Um, And even though I I know much, not all, but I know much of what it teaches about heaven and and eternal life and things that we are looking forward to, 
it's easy for my focus to be in the here and now, in the present, in the moment, and it and it obviously was for them as well. As much as he had talked about it, um, they were going through their own difficulties and, and struggles, uh, and they were focusing on the on the moment, the present, more than they were the future. I think, and that's that's easy to do. We're very physical because we want to see and touch, you know, and know. It feels more real to us that way. I think it's one of the reasons that we still struggle with the understanding of eternal life because the only life that we do know so far is, is in a physical yeah. body, in a physical place where we can see and touch, you know, everything. We use all our senses to do that. And it is hard for us to understand what that's going to be. Yeah. Um. 64, it says, but some of you do not believe me, for Jesus knew from the beginning which ones didn't believe, and he knew who would betray him. The, the, I, I just wrote a question. Is it for us to know those that pretend to believe? Should we concern ourselves with those who are pretenders? Hmm. Jesus knew. We know why he did. I mean, hmm. he's God. But should we concern ourselves with pretenders? It's not our job to judge who is pretending and who's not pretending. But essentially, yes, we should be concerned about it if we can perceive that because it means that they're missing out on what the gospel is all about. And if they're pretending to do it, but they're not actually letting any of that change who they are and they haven't accepted Christ, then... It's always even more sad than just not knowing at all. Yeah, you know, it. We don't have the capabilities of truly knowing. I, I'm I'm a hundred percent convinced that some people, if I had to, to label them believer, non-believer, I would miss it both ways. Mm -hmm. You know, some people that I'm that's like, oh, absolutely believer, believer mm -hmm. may not be truly, mm -hmm. and those I'd like would write off and say non-believer. Actually, some of them may be, mm -hmm. uh, and and so I would know. I think where it concerns us um, is if if it is creating uh, a a problem or a dilemma for other folks, um, where it wreaks havoc. Then I think it would be important to know so that we would know how to respond and, and deal with that. Um, we we know who he's referring to here about Judas. Um, and not just about Judas. I mean, but, he, 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 the ones that aren't going to believe him. Yeah, and him folks who aren't yeah. going to to have any belief in him, you know, whatsoever. Um, you know, I, I think there, there's a bouncing act um, to know based on the, the good of the whole, if that makes any sense. Yeah, so I, I think in, on a general basis, believers, it's not my job. Mm to weed out the pretenders. The time that it's critical is when they're moving up the food chain. Yeah. You know, when when they're going to be teacher, elder, deacon, or teacher, pastor, whatever. You know, I think those things are, um, it's critical for me to weed out the pretenders because pretenders sure. are dangerous at those mm -hmm. levels, you know. Um, and, and I think we're, it's acceptable for us to uh, do that. But then, then he says in verse 65, which this, this is one of those verses that calls me Paul's, and they create lots of conversation among um, theologians. He says, then he said, that is why I said that people can't come to me unless the Father gives them to me. Uh, the New American Standard says, and he was saying, for this reason I've said to you that no one can come to me unless it, it has been granted him from the Father, do you? There is a significant group of people who believe in predestination. Do you believe that's what Jesus was speaking of here? That you can only be saved. Only the ones He has chosen can be saved. It's a dicey question. I'm of the opinion it is His desire for all to come to saving knowledge of the truth. 
I'm also of the opinion he knows those who will and who won't, just like here mm-hmm. in this passage where he says, I know those who believe and I know those who don't. He also obviously knows those who will and who won't, even though it's his desire. Um, you know, to even think that Jesus came and lived life and, and did the sacrifice and gave himself on the cross only for this person, this group, this couple here, and that group of people there, this nation, to me um, would almost seem like a a, a waste in some, some ways. Um, even back earlier in, the, in that passage before that one, uh, in verse 44, he said, No one come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. Um, I think the important thing for us to understand is it is his desire for us to come in, into knowledge. He reaches out to us repeatedly to give us that invite, but then it's up to us to respond to that where we miss the mark. You know, if we choose to ignore, override, um, and just turn away from him. I believe the same thing that um, salvation is available and meant for everyone, but I, I feel I think he's referring to the Holy Spirit who's going to work in someone's life and in their heart, um, because we all can have hardened hearts about a lot of different things, and the gospel is one of those things. And if the Holy you don't allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life, then you're not going to make any changes. You're not going to see the truth. You're not going to want to hear it. You're not going to want to believe in Jesus's message. Yeah, this is a this is the concept of predestination for me is complicated. I certainly didn't grow up with any concept of predestination. As a matter of fact, it would have been heresy in the tribe I grew up in. Um, anything remotely attuned to predestination. And most of the way that I heard it explained um, when you read these is that the, the, most people would say, at least from the side of the fence that my belief system would have started on, would say that in terms of predestination is that Jesus died and predestined everyone to be saved. It's much like he paid for the plane ticket for everybody. Everybody's got a ticket. Whether you get on the plane or not, then it's your choice. Mm-hmm. The question's not whether the ticket has been paid for. The question's not whether it's available for you to do go. The question is whether you're going to get on. And, and of course, we, we, we would, most of us uh, would be considered free will. We, you know, you, you get to choose or not whether that's the case. Um, there is there is a whole group of people who believe in irresistible grace and selection and that or, or election not selection mm-hmm. election and the elect are the ones that come and they can't refuse like they they they, they when they're presented the gospel they will come there's mm-hmm. no, there's no that, that has not been my personal experience even in my own life and it has not been my experience watching other people I've seen some people resist for a long time you know um, and I think it's just a complicated so I don't think we can pass over it and go ah oh, now I got it figured out and they're all everybody else is stupid you know but I do think we have to look at it in the context of you know, because I've always said there are certain sects of religion who believe there are specific numbers of people who are going to yeah. be saved. Right. Now, because I've said, I say it out loud, like if there was like 100,000 of us that were going, I wouldn't tell a soul if I was in. <laughs> That's true. I, I, I would yeah, want to leave some space. Spot, That's, right. That's right. I'd leave, leave some space just, in, yeah. just in case. So oh, man, one, one better just, than you, buddy. You're yeah. out. He's in. You know. Or I just got bumped. That's Dang right. Yeah. yeah. And so it really becomes really complicated when you start limiting in like that. Um, I just think it's. I I, 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 I. Let me say it like this. I want to believe that everybody has the opportunity. That's what I want to believe. Um, I may get up there and be wrong, and I may get left out and go, "Oops, I won't elect it." You know, <laughs> that's possible, uh, but that's not how I see it, yeah. or how I believe it. <clears throat> he goes on to say, <clears throat> at this point, <clears throat> excuse me, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Then Jesus, <clears throat> gracious, I'm straining my throat. 
Then Jesus turned to the twelve and <coughs> asked. Are you checking? <laughs> The mint scratch my. You may finish that verse. (laughs) (coughs) Sixty-seven. Then Jesus turned to the twelve and asked, "Are you also going (coughs) to leave?" These are disciples. Disciple indicates that they're not new converts. Yeah, Mm -hmm. they've been following. They've been watching. They've been learning. They've been growing. They've been becoming as Jesus, and they turn away. Mm. Why do you think this happened? Like, why do you think, what, what can cause a seasoned believer to turn and walk away from their faith? <clears throat> Sometimes it's disillusionment. Um, their perception of what was going to happen, how life was going to look, is different than their perception. You know, I, I'm sure many of these, quote, disciples had these grand illusions. You know, I'm going to be associated with this guy. He He's teaching. He's drawing large crowds. He's doing miracles. You know, he's even talking about eternal life. I want to be a part of that group. You know, it's uh, this, this is up and to the right. This is where the momentum is. This is the gathering the attention. We don't know what the limit of this looks like. Um, you know, it could be endless, and we won't be a part of that. Um but then reality sets in, and and Jesus wasn't always physically with these people uh, outside of the twelve. I'm, I'm speaking of, they had to go back home. They had to go back to jobs. They had to go back to <laughs> spouses. They had to go back to to life as they knew it. And and some of them were were struggling. They were in poverty. Some of them were being persecuted later on. And, and the list goes on and on and on. And uh, it it is easy. For for people to become disillusioned, mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> struggle and pain should should push us to Jesus. It will do one or the other. But it mm-hmm. but it also can it can push us away from and it, well, like you said, one or the other. We mm-hmm. we never. I'm convinced of this. We never stay the same or neutral mm-hmm. uh, with the difficulties and struggles of life. We yeah. either draw closer or, or further. I hear people say <clears throat> it'll make you better or it'll make you bitter. One yeah. of the two. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sure. Why do you think? What would cause somebody? What has caused seasoned believers to walk away? Maybe that you've seen. Um, it seems mostly that it's circumstances in their life that they either did not expect, or maybe they even brought upon themselves, or that they feel um, you know are unfair. And it, they can't explain it away, I guess. Yeah. Like they expect to be able to find some type of reason for what is happening. And we can't always do that. Um, sometimes it seems like it's just part of life. Yeah. It's just part of the way that circumstances have turned out in that situation. And, um, you know, sometimes I think that people are overly spiritual about stuff like that. You know, that if you can't find this spiritual reason to explain away whatever's going on, then you can't fit it into your faith right. and everything starts to unravel. You can't explain everything. Yeah. Yeah, it's impossible. Good. All right, Jay, you want to close this in prayer today? Lord, well, we thank you that you draw us by your spirit and your presence and invite us to be a part of your family and, <clears throat> and become your disciple. In the process of that, help us not become disillusioned or to uh, weaken in our faith when life is difficult or when we are struggling. For those who may be watching or listening to this, may they be encouraged and strengthened knowing that you love them, you care for them, and uh, rather than being pushed or drawn away from you during their challenging times and seasons of life, may they be drawn ever closer to you and become a true disciple as you've designed us to do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.